Thank you, Chairperson, sir. And after a very nice background by Dr. Patni, half of my work is already done. But I'll be elaborating more on pneumococcal vaccine and why it is important. And I have been asked to speak on which, when, and why. So uh -huh. basically, I'll be answering these three questions. Before, Dr. That the background has already been said by Dr. Patni, and my work has been eased up. But at the on onset, I would like to thank Diabetes India for in including this very interesting vaccination workshop in this uh, program because it is oft neglected and this is of utmost importance and adult vaccination is never talked about it's more about about the child uh, vaccination so i i have been asked to talk about pneumococcal vaccines and i have been asked to answer these three questions which when and why so i'll start with why first why we should be vaccinating adults. So I'll be discussing this topic under these headings. So I'll be sharing with you some recommendations from various organizations also, but uh, they are all misleading. And as Patni sir has said that uh, ultimately it is the physician's purgative and how he understands those vaccines and what he understands about the immune status of the patient that is of utmost importance. So why we should be giving adults pneumococcal vaccine and is adult uh, pneumococcal disease is a real cause for concern. So yes, and there's a high risk of mortality. And streptococcus pneumonia, that is the leading cause of community-acquired pneumonias, and at least 90 different serotypes of S pneumonia are there. And now we are having, as we are having more and more of vaccination in children, we are having replacement uh, Stereotypes also. So that is becoming a bigger problem because what we have been vaccinating against, they have been they are being, being they are being replaced by different strains. So that is very important. And eight can cause two-thirds of serious pneumococcal infections in adults. So every vaccine tries to inculcate those particular strains in their armentarium. And infections caused by pneumococcal include pneumococcal pneumonia, bacteremia, and meningitis. And these latter two diseases are also part of the invasive pneumococcal in, uh, infections. So coming to the gravity of the disease, one out of every 20 adults who get pneumococcal pneumonia dies, two of every 10 adults who get bacteremia die, and three out of every 10 adults who get meningitis die. So this is important and it has to be addressed. And these are the various places. And to bring to your notice, the most important thing is the carrier state. And we definitely need to address this also because this is what is spreading this particular disease amongst the masses. So the populations who are at risk of IPD, so if you're seeing, uh, we have got alcohol abuse, congestive heart failure, chronic lung disease, cigarette smoking, recent influenza infection, diabetes mellitus, obviously figures in this list. And if you see that congestive heart failure increases the risk incidence of invasive pulmonary disease, uh, pneumococcal disease by up to 9.9 fold, chronic lung disease by 16.8 and diabetes mellitus by 4.64. So definitely diabetes is a big risk factor for an invasive um, um, IPD. So what about India? So India is a hotbed of pneumococcal disease and the community acquired pneumonia is the second most reason for death from infections, uh, infectious diseases in India. And 36% of isolates from CAP are S pneumonia and 40% of all CAP patients have invasive disease due to S pneumonia. So these are all data from the WHO. So coming to the deadly duo, that is the diabetes and infectious disease. So we all know that we are more focused on the macro and ma microvascular complications of diabetes. And as a treating diabetologist, we are always talking about these things, but these uh, things go in the background. And if you see, there are major causes of mortality and morbidity in our set of patients. And this has, this has been oft shown by the COVID uh, pandemic that, yes, we have to look for the infections also. And these, uh, these have to be addressed. And if we can prevent them uh, by vaccination, we can give them a better quality of life. So prevalence of pneumococcal infections in diabetes. So pneumococcal infections average around 10 to 20 percent, while it may exceed up to 50 percent in higher risk groups. It's estimated that people with diabetes are almost three times at higher risk of death due to pneumonia-related complications. 
and patients with type 1 diabetes and type 2 diabetes have a 4.4 and 1.2 fold risk of pneumonia related hospitalizations respectively so what i was emphasizing is this yes we have both mortality and morbidity associated with uh, pneumonia in conjunction with people with diabetes so these factors we all know what are the reasons which predispose to respiratory infections in diabetes it could be poor antibody response cell mediated abnormalities decreased cd4 cd8 ratios changes in natural killer cell function reduced lymphocyte blastogenesis defects in interleukin 2 function and so on so this is all we have been being bombarded year on that these are the reasons for this and this is another uh, interesting um, which has shown that after tuberculosis the pneumococcal pneumonia is the reason for vaccine preventable deaths so we have to take into care and the best way to prevent pneumococcal disease is to get the vaccine so now coming to the second question which which is what are the types of the vaccines what are their differences what are the adverse events associated with them and what are the special situations so basically what we have in india are just two vaccines one is the conjugated vaccine that is the 13 serotype prevener 13 which is being uh, made by the pfizer inc and the another one is the polysaccharide vaccine containing 23 serotypes the pneumovax 23 which is being produced by the mst and in usa we have got uh, uh, others also that is the pneumococcal conjugate vaccine that is pcv15 and pcv20 and it is being used more uh, often now if you see the most recent uh, CDC guidelines you will see that they are using more of 15 and 20 uh, uh, in their regimens but we all we have only one conjugate vaccine that is the PCV13 and PCV7 also we have which is being provided by the uh, Serum Institute and the pneumococcal vaccine we have that is the PPSV23. So the conjugate vaccine why it is important so the, the conjugate vaccine is supposed to have be more efficient than the polysaccharide vaccine for the prevention of pneumococcal disease in children on account of immunological considerations and based on safety, immunogenicity and efficacy trials. And recommendations from vaccinations are based on the main risk factors for infectious diseases such as age, presence of chronic diseases, immunosuppression, smoking status, alcohol use and ethnic. And as regards to pneumococcal polysaccharide vaccine, so this is a polyvent sterile liquid vaccine for intramuscular or subcutaneous Injection consisting of a mixture of highly purified capsular polysaccharides from the 23 most prevalent of invasive pneumococcal types of streptococcus pneumoniae. So this contains 25 micrograms of purified capsular polysaccharide. The dose is 0.5 ml and these are the serotypes which are used and the most important six serotypes that is the 6P, 9V, 14, 19A, 19F and 23F which are responsible for the most severe IPD are included in this vaccine. So this is the most easiest to understand. So if you have a polysaccharide vaccine, not too effective in infants, so you do don't give polysaccharide vaccines in the young group, that is less than two years. Conjugate vaccines are used in the, uh, the uh, vaccination for the children. They have a longer lasting protection, reduce pneumococcal transmission. So that is very important that we need to have vaccines which prevent the transmission also not just the invasive disease and have better indirect protection. So these are the two vaccines which are available, which is the Prevenar, which I have told you that is the 13 one and the Pneumocil, which is being made by the Serum Institute of India. And these are the uh, uh, ways the presentation is four dose well and the other one is five dose well. Both are to be given intramuscular and the dose is three doses at six weeks intervals. So now coming to Basically, we are uh, talking about the adult vaccination. So we will be focusing more on PCV13 and PCV23. So the constituents of PCV13 are two to uh, four microgram of each polysaccharide antigen conjugated individually to diphtheria cross-reactive material. That is the CRM197 carrier protein and are adjuvant adjuvanted with aluminum phosphate. And the PPV23 has got 23 valent adjuvant free pneumococcal polysaccharide vaccine, PPVS23, containing 25 micrograms each of unconjugated polysaccharide antigens from 23 serotypes. So, as regards to the immunity afforded by these two vaccines, the PCV13 scores because it evokes the T cell mediated 
dependent humoral responses so it is it is making uh, a longer lasting immunity and uh, and it is uh, more ben may benefit immunocompromised individuals and elderly persons also the capsular polysaccharide vaccine it elicits a humoral immune response mediated by b lymphocytes so the effect is shorter and it is not long lasting as regards to efficacy pcv are effective against both ipd and non bacteremic pneumonia while the uh, ppv ppv23 that is a polysaccharide vaccine is only uh, protects against invasive that is bacterial pneumococcal pneumonia and we have got large number of studies to compare the efficacy but we do not have had to have trials for these two trials so these pair data from germany and usa they have shown that in older age uh, older adults the effectiveness ranges from 12 to 8.8 percent with the P PCV13 and 3 to 1, 3 and 1 percent because these two data were from different countries um, for the PPV23. So the other thing is about the opsonophagocytic activity. So it is more so with the PCV13. So this is the basic thing which tells about how effective that particular vaccine is against the bacteria. So now coming to the most important thing, when vaccination schedule. So this is the just a brief reminder for what is the universal immunization program. So this has been incorporated with the children. So it has to be given six weeks, 14 weeks and nine months. So this is the first, second and third dose of the PCV that is the conjugated vaccine. So it is now part of the universal immunization program for the children. And uh, for the adults, we have PCV13. It has to be given as an intramuscular injection. And each 0.5 ml suspension of intramuscular injection is supplied in a single dose pre-filled syringe. And the preferred site of administration are anteloated respect of thigh in infants, we all know. And the vaccine should not be injected in the gluteal region or areas where there may be a major nerve trunk or blood vessels. As for PPV, S23 is given either intramuscular, most of the case intramuscular, or it can also be given subcutaneous also. A single dose of 0.5 ml dose of PPV, PP, S23 is administered intramuscularly or subcutaneous only. So these are the side effects and these are the side effects which are associated with most of the vaccines that you are giving. So it could be redness, swelling, pain or tenderness, fever, loss of appetite. So these uh, side effects are common with most of the vaccines. So there are not any major side effects associated with these vaccines. Then coming to efficacy, so we have got large number of data uh, as regards to the efficacy of Agents and I have told you that that we have to understand is that PC13, the conjugate vaccine, it have, because of its T cell mediator function, has got a longer duration of protection as compared to PPPS23, which has got a shorter duration because it is more of humoral immunity. Then coming to the guideline recommendations, so I have put in this this particular mark, which is slightly tilted because different organizations have given different recommendations for vaccination. And I, I think that we have to evolve some particular thing and our own organization that is the RSSDI has done a work and we have put in some recommendations for that which are very apt for our set of patients. So these are the recommendations. The American Diabetes Association recommends for all diabetic patients more than two years of age. And the Advisory Committee of Immunization that is the ACIP, all patients at age 65 years, adults 19 to 64 years, with special condi conditions or with immunocompromised status. Same holds true for the Australian, Canadian, United Kingdom, and the Juridic Society of India. So for adults with age more than 19 to 65 years, pneumococcal vaccination usually not recommended for healthy adults less than 65 years. But they, if they have some special conditions like chronic heart disease, chronic liver disease, poorly controlled diabetes mellitus, chronic lung disease, and in current smokers, there you have to give a single dose of PCV13, that is a conjugate vaccine, followed by the PPVS23, eight, uh, more than eight weeks, if the patient is immunocompromised. And for age 65 years or older, older vaccination with PP, PPSV3 in all adult 65 years is recommended because of the overall higher incidence of in, immuno, invasive pneumococcal disease. And this time ACIP has said that first you should give a conjugate vaccine followed by a PPVS23. I'll be discussing that. As regards to the ACE recommendations, 
so they have put in as regards to pcv13 one or two injections two to eight years ppsv23 uh, more than 65 years PC, pvc30 that is a conjugate vaccine followed by the ppvs23 for people more than 65 years and for patients 19 to 60 years again if their health if there are any health conditions or immunocompromised then we have to give P, P, uh, this conjugate vaccine followed by the ppvs23 so this is what Dr. Patni was speaking about. This is the entire uh, conundrum, how we have to do for patients who have not been previously vaccinated, a dose of PCP13, 15 or 20, followed by PCP, uh, the polysaccharide vaccine one year later. So this is what it is like. So they have demarcated as regards to different um, uh, people, like uh, uh, those who have received the vaccines early on, so what type of vaccine was added? So they have categorized this particular list. So our interest is more on the special conditions, which includes uh, diabetes mellitus. For those patients who have not been previously re received any of the vaccines, PCV15 is used. This should be followed by a dose of PPSV23 given at least one year after the PCV15 dose. And the minimum interval is eight weeks between PCV15 and PPSV23 if the patient is immunocompromised. Then coming to the RSSTI 2022 guidelines. So these guidelines, we are all part of these guidelines. So they say that the secondary immune re response after PCV13 immunization is higher, whereas the response is lower after immunization with PPSV23. So this is already, we have shown you the studies also. The panel recommends the use of PCV13 for adults more than 50 years, followed by a dose of PPSV23 at least one year later and at least five years after their PP. Of after their previous PPSV23 dose, depending on the clinical judgment of the physician. And these recommendations are in line with the guidelines of ADA 2017 and also in synergy with the guidelines related recently by the Indian Society of Nephrology, Indian Academy of Allergy, and the Geriatric Society of India. And PCV13 is available for vaccination of, uh, of older adults and must be considered an important step for vaccinating older diabetes patients with an age of more than 50 years. Earlier, the dictum was that you give PCV13 before 65, and after that you have to give PPV, PP, this polysaccharide vaccine. But now these new things are coming that you have to give PCV13, 15, or 20 first, followed by the polysaccharide vaccine. And PPSV23 may be offered to immune compromised patients with diabetes for addi additional coverage after PCV13. Repeated vaccinations with PPSV23 must be avoided to prevent hyporesponsiveness. So that is very important. And clinical judgment in relation to individual subjects should be relied upon before these recommendations are put into practice. So they have put the ball on the treating physician also. Then we have guidelines from the Geriatric Society of India, Indian Society of Nephrology. So I have tried to summarize these guidelines. PCV13 should be given minimum one year after PPV23. PPV23 should be given a minimum one year after PCV13, except in immunocompromised adults for whom the minimum interval should be eight weeks. So this is a very important slide because this is the gist of whatever we have discussed till now. Minimum gap between PPV23 doses should be five years. When both vaccines are indicated, PCV13 should be given first. Both vaccines should not be co-administered. When indicated, both vaccines should be given to adults whose vaccination history is unknown or incomplete. And when re-vaccination is indicated with PPV23, the second dose should be administered a minimum five years after the initial dose of PPV23 and a minimum eight weeks after PCV13 dose. And revaccination with PCV13 is not recommended and revaccination with PPV23 should be done only once. And both pneumococcal and influenza vaccines can be co-administered at different sites. So future direction because all these vaccines were based on the capsular polysaccharides. So now we have identified different things which can be used as our, our uh, sites for getting this, uh, uh, this immunity. So new things have been identified like the pneumolysin, which is responsible for the, uh, the bacterial adherence, histidine, triad, protein D, surface protein A and C. So all these things are, these are the candidate vaccines to be developed in the future and they will be more effective in preventing the pneumococcal disease. So summarizing my top, Apart from considering conventional micro and macrovascular events as diabetes complications, 
Infections due to influenza and pneumococci should be regarded as having significant public health importance. So I think in last 18, 20 minutes, I could drum this particular thing. All clinics when vac where vaccinations are being advocated for diabetes should keep records of it so that the efficacy of vaccination may be assessed in relation to occurrence of fever, pneumonia, or hospitalization is vaccinated. So we need to have evidence for that. It is not just about, because we are go going to give a very costly thing, so we must have the evidence to prove that. And we need to have more and more data from India as regards to the efficacy of these vaccinations. And the vaccination strategies in diabetes should evolve as part of routine care and a central registry needs to be maintained. And I think this is a mandate for our own body, that is the RSSDI and the Diabetes Industry uh, India. And the long-term studies and research aimed at evaluating the cost effectiveness, uh, effectiveness of vaccination among diabetes patients in India would provide more evidence and support for the suggested vaccination guidelines. So thank you. This is uh, an offbeat topic. Thank you very much. And this is the famous Rumi gate, and it was eliminated blue on 14th November last time by our own body, that is RSTA. Thank you very much for patience. Thank you, Dr.